Okay, so uh, welcome everybody and welcome to all those in internet land. And I'm going to get my clicker. Get my clicker going. So we got to skip to where we left off. Then I remember where we left off. We were like on the third, this one has a kind of a third page, so, or it doesn't have kind of a third page, it just has a third page. Sorry. Here we go. There we go. All right. Um, so we're on 31, is that what we're on? Okay. So we want to get uh, how salt spreads and disperses in the ocean. Uh, okay, this is all about precipitation. Precipitation. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so how do ions disperse through the seawater? They disperse through diffusion, okay? And diffusion is a very slow process, and diffusion is actually what's going to happen over here, okay? So remember how I said that I'm going to leave this for the whole rest of the semester, and it's going to stay like this. And that's because the salt is diffusing through here. Um, it's diffusing through here uh, based on diffusion, okay? It's very slow. So it's just the kind of atom by atom movements. Okay, that's called dispersion, diffusion, sorry. So that's diffusion. Now, there's another way that's more efficient to make the salt mix and spread through the ocean. Okay, so what is the other way that I could do to get the salt to spread through here more effectively? What's that? Yeah, just if I shook it or stirred it, right? So, so that's, that's something else, right? So shake, so basically shaking or, or stirring would just be through through um, mixing, okay? So that's another way. So it's just the currents, the waves, mixing, you know, mixing up the ocean. Okay. So that's that's another way to get uh, to get salt to spread. Okay, I talked about different sources of salts in the ocean. I mentioned um, I mentioned rivers, of course. I also mentioned mid-ocean ridges, right? So you know mid-ocean ridges have a lot of hydrothermal activity going on. These hydrothermal vents, these are hydrothermal vents, right? The black smokers. And that black smoke that you see is actually precipitated, you know, precipitated uh, solids that are coming out of the vents. And wow, look at all these different. Okay, so those consist of a lot of things uh, like iron hydroxide and iron sulfides, okay? And this is a map that shows mid-ocean ridges around the world. And wherever you see stars, those are the locations of different black smokers and hydrothermal vents that are constantly releasing salts into the ocean, okay? So you need to know that. Now, um, here's a question for you. Hot water or cold, or you could take a look at, here's some tea. Have you ever tried to make sweet tea? And have you ever, what happens if you get the water really cold, you get it like that, and you try to dissolve sugar into that cold water? It takes forever, it takes forever right? It, and usually the it's sugar like sinks to the bottom. No, that's not how you make sweet tea, right? You have to like make hot tea first, and then dissolve the sugar, and then you can cool it down. That's how you should make sweet tea. Right, so you know that if you put some tea, you put some sugar in hot tea, it dissolves right away, okay? Same thing with any kind of salt in, in the ocean, right? Salt dissolves much more effectively uh, in hot water than it does cold water, okay? It dissolves much more effectively. So the water that's coming out, right, that's circulating through these mid-ocean ridges, it is really hot. And I talked about this before in this class, right? It is really hot. It's 350 degrees Celsius. And the only reason it doesn't immediately evaporate is because of what? Do you all remember that we talked about this before? Why doesn't that water immediately evaporate if it's 350 degrees Celsius? It's way above the boiling point. The pressure. It's the pressure. So it's just because it's under a lot of pressure, because it's at the bottom of the ocean. That's why it doesn't. It doesn't just immediately evaporate. So you can get it really hot, just like you can a pressure cooker. Did you know, like, when you put, have you ever used a pressure cooker before, like, a, 
Instapot. Instapot, yeah. You ever, I have an Instapot. I love Instapot. They are great. If you can afford one, get one. I, you can make yogurt. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta stop because I have to. I really got a lot to cover today. But yeah, I love Instapot. I wish I could teach a class on Instapot. But anyway, all things. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so you can get the Instapot is great because it's a pressure cooker. You can get things. You get the water a lot hotter, and that's why you can cook like beans a lot faster. You can cook beef or whatever a lot faster. Because you can get the water hotter than boiling point because of the pressure. Same thing happens here. And you can dissolve stuff a lot um, more effectively with that really hot water, 350 degree water. Okay, so it dissolves the rocks a lot more effectively. So, so that's another source, again, of salt in the ocean. Okay, so um, those volatiles that are, you know, besides a lot of salts, another thing that's that gets uh, dissolved in there are gases, okay? A lot of gases. So that includes like uh, CO2, carbon dioxide gas, you know? That's uh, a, lot, a, lot of that, a lot of that gas is carbon dioxide. There's also things like chlorine, sulfur, hydrogen, fluorine, nitrogen, all gases that are dissolved coming from the volcanic, you know, volcanic outgassing. They're dissolved into the, into the hydrothermal waters and they get added to the, they get added to the, uh, chemically added to the, to the oceans, okay? Those are called excess volatiles. Oh, notice that number 34, I'm sorry I'm going so fast with this stuff, but I just got a lot of material to cover here. Number 34 says, um, generally speaking, hot water dissolves salts more effectively, but there's one important exception, okay? Are you ready for this? And that exception is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide dissolves more readily in cold water than it does hot water. Carbon dioxide dissolves more easily or more readily into cold water than hot water. Has anyone ever opened a, a really hot two-liter bottle of soda? Like it just, it was in your car all day, it's August, you get it out, for some reason, I don't know why you'd want red hot soda, but you open it up. Has anyone ever done that before? And it, it kind of, it, it almost explodes, right? I don't know, has anyone ever noticed that? Sure. Yeah, because the carbon dioxide comes out of it more effectively. It's better to have your soda, your two liter bottle of soda, ice cold, because then that, that CO2 is gonna stay dissolved in the soda because it's colder. So you know how sometimes, I mean, you've probably seen things like, what is going on here? What blank? No, it's too far. I, I show somebody getting blown up in the face with soda. It's okay. So anyway, CO2 dissolves in cold water more easily than hot water. So just FYI, be aware of that. That's an important, an important facet. All right, so we got 34. We got 35. We got 36, right? Excess volatiles here. 37, excess volatiles. 36 is just showing some of the things that are getting released here, okay? So are we all good? We finished, basically finished page, the third page of the last lecture assignment. So you all got that now? Everybody good? All right, so we're done with we're done with lecture assignment number fourteen. Okay. Thirty-eight. Oh, so those are the those are the gases right there: CO two, chlorine, sulfur, hydrogen, fluorine, nitrogen. The stuff that's actually getting emitted, the salts that are getting emitted, are things like there are a lot of iron that iron sulfide and iron hydroxide. That's mostly the solids that are getting that are getting released. It's all it's it's listed right there. I guess there's helium too, I didn't know that.
Okay, so we're all good now? So we're ready for lecture assignment number 15 now? Okay, so let's keep going. By the way, this is just, I just, I don't ask about this on the test or anything, but I just found this fascinating. Is that, have you all seen narwhals before? They look like mythical creatures. They're not. My daughter, literally, she saw these. She's like, are these real or fake? Can you tell me? She'll go through like all the like unicorns. Are those real? No. Yeah. No. Narwhals, are those real? Those are real. Yeah. It's like that. But anyway. <clears throat> Uh, but they actually, nobody really knows exactly why they have this like elongated tooth, right? So it's like a tusk. But for some reason, it is so, whatever the reason is that they have it, they, um, it's packed with kind of nerve endings that allow them to detect the salinity of water. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know exactly like why that is. Nobody knows exactly why that is. I don't know. Maybe a good thing to write a discussion post about it. You can find more information about it. But I thought it was kind of interesting. Is this just a video on narwhals? It might be. Yeah, it's a video on narwhals. So anyway, it's weird, isn't it? It's like why did why did only the males have it? But it doesn't. They never find them fighting with the tusks. So why? It doesn't make much sense. But it's the way it is. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's go on to lecture assignment number fifteen. How does salt affect the melting point, boiling point of water? So why does this happen? So um, you might remember that H two O molecules will bond together by hydrogen bonding, right? So when you add salt to things, you might know that it changes melting points and freezing points, things like that, right? So, you know, for example, if you throw salt on ice, what does it do with ice? It, it melts it, right? And it melts it because it's actually interrupting and disturbing those hydrogen bonds. Okay, so, so salt always has the effect of kind of disturbing hydrogen bonds, stopping hydrogen bonds from forming effectively. Okay, so in the case of ice, it's, it lowers the melting point so that ice forms at a lower temperature. In, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, evaporation, it actually impedes evaporation. So it's actually a little bit harder to evaporate salt water than it is pure water. Okay, so that's why, you know, we throw salt on ice to melt the ice. It acts as kind of a natural antifreeze. 
So uh, like I said, it has also a similar effect on water. It, it changes the boiling point, the evaporation point. So it's actually easier to evaporate pure water, boil off pure water, than it is to evaporate or boil off salt water. Uh, a little bit more about chemical effects of salt water. You know, salt water also, as you know, is an effective oxidizer, right? So you've seen what salt water can do to, to metal, especially iron. It's very effective at, at a dissolving and, and oxidizing iron. Um, another thing that happens, uh, it's important for saltwater and living organisms, is those of you who maybe are a biology major, you've heard about this. Has it, you all heard about osmosis before? Osmosis, eh, a little bit. People that are studying nursing, they know all about this stuff, but osmosis. But uh, osmosis is the transport of um, solvents. They tend to pass through a semi-permeable membrane from a less concentrated solution to a more concentrated one. So when you have pure fresh water, pure fresh water is going to pass through a, like a membrane, like a cellular membrane, uh, if, if this is particularly, uh, or it's more salty, okay? So perhaps you've actually encountered this before. Um, has anyone ever, for example, like peeled potatoes or cut up potatoes or something like that and then put them in some fresh water before you boil them or something like that? Has anyone ever done that before? Maybe I'm the only one who does that. I don't know. But, but um, if you did that, you'd actually watch them swell up because the fresh water that you put is actually being transported into their cellular membrane. And so they'll actually swell up. And it'll, it'll actually burst the, can actually burst the um, cells. So this means that a living cell that's acclimated to fresh water, that means it's used to fresh water, will lose H2O when it's submerged in salt water because it's trying to equilibrate the salinity on either side of the membrane. So this is why you can't drink salt water to quench your thirst, right? Because if you drink salt water, the water that's in your cells, your living cells, are going to try to cross the membrane to equilibrate the, um, the, the concentration of salinity. So that's why there are saltwater fish, and there are freshwater fish, and there are some fish that can go back and forth, but usually it's like you're either saltwater or you're freshwater, right? Because there, you, you have a certain salinity level in, in your living tissues. So that's why you cannot drink salt water. So if you're ever stuck on a raft like that, you can't, you can't drink salt water. Okay, so those are just a few, um, those are just a few kind of random things about salt and effect of salt on, uh, on water. I want you to be a, uh, aware. Okay. All right, so in the previous lecture, we talked about kind of the major components that are dissolved into the ocean's waters, right? So what are some of those major chemical components that comprise sea salt that are dissolved into the ocean water? What are like the major things, the most important elements that are dissolved in there? You should know this. Calcium? Yeah, calcium, sure. There are some other ones, though, that are really big. You should know. Sodium? Yeah, uh, sodium. What else? OK, what's dissolved? What is the sea salt made of? It's actually up there. Sodium? Yeah, sodium. What else? Chloride. Chloride, yeah, sodium chloride, table salt. Sulfate. Yeah, sulfate. What's, the, what's another one It's very important? Yeah, magnesium. Okay, then remember those are like 99% of what the sea salt's made out of. Maybe not 99%, but pretty close to 99%. Okay, and then you have calcium and potassium. 
But there's also a lot of minor constituents, okay? A little, what we call trace elements. So trace elements are the elements that are dissolved in the seawater in very small abundances. So the major constituents are things like sodium, chloride, sulfate, magnesium, calcium, potassium, but then there's the trace elements, the minor constituents. It's, those are the elements that are dissolved in seawater in small amounts, okay, small trace abundances. Does that make sense? Like boric acid? Yeah, like boric acid, sure. Yeah, pretty small amount of boric acid. So you would maybe call that a trace element. So these are all the major constituents, right? Chloride, sodium, sulfate, calcium, potassium, bicarbonate, magnesium. And these are the things that are maybe starting to be trace elements, okay? Those are things like bromide, borate, strontium, fluoride, manganese, iron, zinc, copper, vanadium, nickel, lead, cadmium, ar mercury, arsenic. Okay? So very small abundance. but they are there. One thing that should kind of shock you is the fact that iron is in such a small abundance. Very, very small. Iron is a trace element in seawater, which should be shocking because there's a lot of iron in earth. There's a lot in the rocks, there's a lot in the crust, there's a lot in the sediments, there's a lot, but it's very, it's trace in the seawater. And that's because it's such a hot item. It, a, it precipitates out easily, and B, it's a very hot item among uh, marine life, right? So they use that iron um, big time. Okay, so iron right there, and it's in this thing. Do you know it? You've probably never seen this strange symbol before. You see this symbol? Has anyone ever seen that before? Does anybody know what it is? It's, yeah, micro, that's right. It is a microgram per liter. Microgram per liter. Uh, so this is actually equivalent to, this is actually, uh, gosh, a microgram per gram would be PPF, right? Microgram, yeah, a million, parts per million. So this is a very small amount. This is like a billion, right? So this is, a, this is in very, very, very small amounts. Micrograms per liter. Okay, a liter is a thousand grams. So it's a microgram per, so it's basically like, yeah, a billion. It's very small amounts. So iron is only abundant in the ocean in like, really it's kind of like parts per billion. Do you see what I mean? They're very, very small. 1.7 parts per billion. So if you have a billion grams of ocean water, you only expect to have one gram of iron. That's all. Okay. So like I said, that should be pretty shocking because it's, it's such an abundant element elsewhere in the earth. Okay, so you got some examples of trace elements, right? Are we all on the same page on what a trace element is? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So um, we actually did this last time, but let's take a look at kind of trace elements that are in, oh yeah, I thought this was fun too. There's even a little bit of gold dissolved in the ocean water. There's a little bit. And it's, this is how much there is. Look at this. 0, 0.0 PPT. Does anybody know what PPT means? Parts per trillion. Yeah, parts per trillion. So that means that if you, you know, boil off a trillion gallons of water, you could get, you know, like a gallon, a 0 0.03 gallons of gold. Does that seem worth it? I don't know. But seriously, people investigate things like this to make money, you know, to like, is it worth it, you know, to boil off that much water to get the gold out? You know, so. But if the price of gold goes up, you know, it could be, so it's kind of funny. Is it worth it? I don't know. Okay, so um, oh 
oh yeah, I forgot. Number seven is kind of in a weird place. Because do you remember that we actually compared the two? We compared fresh water and salt water last lecture. That number seven should actually be from the last lecture. But do you remember? Here, I could go. Let me go back to that slide really quick to remind you. Oh no, here it is. Okay. That's okay. So remember how we are comparing like fresh stream water to, to, to ocean water, right? So take a look at this. Um, now this is the ocean water compared to the river water. Now when we looked at it last time, we were actually looking at absolute values, like how much of each constituent is actually dissolved in you know, each liter of ocean water versus river water. But now we're going to look at it in terms of percentage so that we can kind of compare apples to apples between river water and ocean water, OK? So I just want to make something. I just kind of want you to take a look at these two graphs, OK? So what do you see? Are there differences between ocean water and river water in terms of like the percentage of what salts are actually composed of? Okay, what are some things that are different? What are some things that scream out to you? Very, very different. Yeah, river water has a lot of silica. Okay, and we noted that, actually some people noted that last time, you know, last lecture, right? So there's a lot of silica in the river water. Trace amounts in the ocean, just trace. Notice there's a lot more iron actually too, right? So there's iron in the river water, but not in the ocean. It's just trace parts per billion in the, in the ocean. So why is that? Why is the silica and the iron, why is it very depleted in the oceans? Um, yeah, it's, it's, so it's being used up very quickly by marine life. Okay, by, by photoplankton and things like that. What are some other things that are just way, way different? Sodium is a lot more concentrated in the oceans, right? Chloride is much more concentrated. So one thing that I hope that you see is, is this important principle, okay? Uh, ocean water is not just concentrated river water. It's not like we just took river water and boiled it down until it was super concentrated, okay? So it's not just concentrated river water. There are big differences. Actually, if you look at these, most things are different. There's very few of these that are even remotely close, okay? So it's not like these are it's not like the ocean is just boiled down concentrated river water. That's the that's the main point you're supposed to take away here. So that's number seven, okay? Number eight, we've already talked about multiple times, so hopefully you can answer that on your own now. Now another interesting thing about ocean salinities is this. You know that surface salinity changes from place to place, right? So there are some places that have very strong salinities. There are other places that have, you know, they're relatively more fresh, right? So you're, you're on board with that, okay? So one thing though is that if you actually look at the salt content, so let's say, what's, what's a place that has really high salt content? What's a body of water in the ocean that's really high salt content? Yeah, the dead, the, well, the, the Red Sea, let's talk about the Red Sea, because the Dead Sea is kind of its own thing. It's not really part of the ocean, per se. Um, but let's say the Red Sea, right, right there. Okay, you can see it's very saline. The Mediterranean is also very saline. Okay, so you all see that? Okay, what's a place that is very fresh, relatively fresh? Okay, near the poles, right? So, so, so they're near the poles, okay? Now, what's kind of interesting is that even though it has very different salinities, the composition of the actual sea salt is almost exactly the same. Okay, it's almost exactly the same. So that is, that's known as uh, Forshammer's principle, okay? It's, it, and I'll say it again so that it, hopefully it sinks in. It's that the composition of the salt, 
across the ocean, across the oceans of the world, is almost exactly the same. So even though there are differences in how much salt is actually concentrated in that ocean water, the Mediterranean, or the Arctic Ocean, or North Pacific, or South Pacific, or blah, 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 the composition of that salt is almost exactly the same no matter where you go, okay, with, with few exceptions. Cool. So does that, and that's called Poor Shammer's Principle. So does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So if I had a test question or something like that that says like, how does the, this would be a really tricky question. I don't think I would do this, but I could, right? How does the composition of sea salt in the Mediterranean compare to the composition of sea salt in the Arctic Ocean? What would you say? It's the same, right? It's the same, and that's Forshammer's principle. So what they realize early on is that you, no matter where you go in the ocean, you have different levels of salinity, but that salt is the same in its composition, what it's made of. It has the same proportion of sodium, the same proportion of chloride, the same proportion of magnesium and sulfate and gold and boric acid and bromide and all the other things, okay? Just kind of amazing when you think about it. So let me just ask you, can anyone kind of like, taking that principle, everything is the same everywhere in terms of the salt, you know, what kind of salt, uh, what the salt's actually made of. Can anybody draw any conclusions about how well mixed the ocean is? Does that seem to say that the ocean is pretty well mixed and mixes up a lot, or that it doesn't really mix too much? It's well mixed. It's well mixed. And actually, you're going to find that is true. The ocean really is very well mixed. So the currents and the waves and the there's both vertical currents and there's you know also surface currents and things like that. Those are doing a really great job of mixing the ocean water. Okay. So um, let's move on a little bit. Here is the seawater. So. Uh, So another thing I wanted to ask you here. We have the oceans of the world constantly bringing salt into the ocean, right? We have volcanic outgassing constantly bringing salt into the ocean. So here's a question for you. Are the oceans getting saltier over time? Have they been like every million years, do they get saltier and saltier and saltier and saltier? Maybe in like 10 million years, do you think they're going to be like just super saline? Nothing's going to be able to live in them? And what do you think? You think they're going to get always get salter, saltier and saltier and saltier and saltier? So Amanda's saying yes. No idea? Not sure? Any, I don't know. Does anybody have any ideas about that? So actually, what we find is that it actually will not get saltier. So the oceans are in a state of chemical equilibrium. So that means that it's going, the salinities are going to stay relatively the same, and the, the composition of those salts will stay relatively the same. Everything is in, in a, remarkable, a remarkable state of equilibrium. And the reason why, by the way, that they don't get saltier is because there are actually processes that remove salt from the ocean, and there are processes that bring salt in. So, they balance each other out. Okay. So the count, so the oceans are in a perfect state, not perfect, but near perfect state of chemical equilibrium. That means that the salinities are constant, they're not changing. The composition of the sea salt is constant, it's not changing. It's not in a state of flux, it's in a state of equilibrium. So the, the opposite of equilibrium would be a state of flux. Things are changing. Equilibrium means that it's constant, it's not changing. Okay, so does that all make sense? Are you all with me so far? So if this is true, right, 
if it's true that the salinity of the ocean is not changing, there has to be some process that is removing salt from the ocean, right? There has to be, because otherwise the oceans would get constantly saltier, and they don't. All right, so now um, there's going to be some new vocabulary, okay? Ways of thinking about, about uh, chemical equilibrium. Okay. So you got to kind of stay with me here. I know this is kind of thick, but dry, but you have to stay with me. So it gets a little bit complicated. Okay. All right, so let me try to explain this. Um, so the ocean is what we could call a reservoir. Okay. That means that it holds certain chemical components. What are some of the chemical components that the ocean holds that we've already talked about a lot in this le last two lectures? What are some chemical components the ocean holds? Chlorine, right? Calcium. What's that? Carbon? Yeah, absolutely. Carbon. Anything else? Can anybody else think of any other chemicals that the ocean holds? There's a lot of them, right, that we've talked about. Iron, gold, you know, carbon dioxide, carbon. You know, there, you could make, go on and on and on naming different. Okay, so the ocean is a reservoir for those chemical components, okay? Now, there are things that are called fluxes. The fluxes are, are shown with these arrows, okay? Do you see the arrows going in and coming out? Those are called fluxes. Fluxes are any process that moves whatever chemical constituent you're talking about into the reservoir or out of the reservoir, okay? This is a flux. This is a flux. This is a flux. These fluxes are going into the reservoir. This flux is coming out of the reservoir. Now take a look at this. I know this is very abstract and generalized here because we're not actually talking about particular reservoir with particular chemical constituent. But do you notice how the fluxes going into the reservoir are the same as the fluxes going out of the reservoir? Okay, do you all see that? There are two fluxes going in, each are at five, and whatever units, okay? I'm not assigning any units to this, I'm just saying it's just five could be five grams per year, it could be five trillion grams per year, it could be whatever, okay? But it's just five. So the, so the flux is going into the reservoir of five. The fluxes coming out of the reservoir are 10. So are the fluxes going in the same as the fluxes going out? Yeah. Right, so you all see that, okay? That means this reservoir is in steady state in regards to whatever chemi chemical constituent we're talking about. It's in steady state. The ocean, with very few exceptions, is in, a, is in steady state for, for almost all chemical constituents. I'll talk about some chemical constituents that are not, but uh, most of them are. So you should be able to answer number 11 now, right? Oh wait, we gotta, we gotta answer, are there any chemical components of the ocean that are not in steady state? Now there's another thing here, and it's called residence time. Residence time is the average amount of time that a particular chemical component spends in that reservoir, okay? So the way that you calculate that is you take the amount that's in the reservoir and you divide it by the total flow in or the total flow out. It doesn't matter if you do the flow in or the flow out because the flow in and the flow out are the same in a steady state system. Okay. Are you all with me here? You might have to do this on the test, folks, so you should know how to do this. It's on Monday. Okay, so does that all make sense? So in this case, what is the residence time? 
I know it's calculated here. I'll stand right here. But what's the, what's the residence time for this example right here? You take the reservoir and you divide it by the total flow in or the total flow out. It should be the same. So what would be the residence time of this example right here? Two. It's just two. And we don't know. I didn't assign units, so it's just two. Okay, so it would just be two. Okay. Easy, right? You're just dividing the you're just dividing the size of the reservoir by the flux in or the flux out. Okay, so the reservoir holds some chemical component for some time. That's what a reservoir is. The flux is some process that either adds or removes the component from the reservoir. Notice the fluxes going in and coming out are equal. That means the reservoir is in equilibrium or steady state. How long on average does a particular molecule reside in the reservoir? That's called the residence time. It's how long a particular molecule, whatever chemical we're interested in, stays in that reservoir. That's called residence time. All right, so let's think about this in a real life example. Let's say, what we're, let's say that we're looking at the ocean, the ocean's our reservoir, and the chemical component we're interested in is just salt, okay? What are the fluxes what are the actual processes, fluxes, that are adding salt to the ocean, coming in, going in? Yeah, so the geothermal, the, hy you know, the hydrothermal vents, and the rivers runoff, right? Those, are the, those would be the actual fluxes going in. The fluxes going out, now remember I said there has to, because the ocean is in steady state, there has to be fluxes going out so that the ocean is not getting saltier or less salty over time, okay? So, the things that are going out are things like sea spray. Has anyone ever noticed that sometimes you're at the beach, some things are kind of coated in salt or there's salt, some things are kind of salty next to the beach? It's because the oceans are constantly, you know, spraying out sea salt. It actually enters the atmosphere. So there's actually salt leaving in the, in the form of mist and spray, okay? So that's something that removes it. And it's actually also um, removing, there's biologic processes that remove it. There's also uh, adsorption, different chemical processes that remove salt. And also subduction is another way that, that salt is lost as well. You know how subduction, this ocean floor subducts, it goes into the mantle. That's another way salt, a big way salt is lost from the ocean as well. Okay. So there are processes that are removing the salt as well. All right, so if you go to, um, so that's actually number 13. Number 12, you have to draw a block diagram just like this, showing a reservoir in steady state with fluxes in and out. You should indicate the magnitude of each reservoir and calculate the residence time of the reservoir. And you can use, I mean, if you really just wanted to copy this, you could copy it, but it would be good if you, you know, did a different example so that, it, you know, you can practice this because I could put this on the test. I can't remember if it's on there, but it might be on there. So you should be able to do that, right, number 12. Just give an example of a block diagram like that showing a reservoir, fluxes going in, fluxes... And you can make it really easy. You could have one flux going in, one flux going out. But you have to make sure that the magnitude of the flux going in is the same as the magnitude of the flux going out. Okay. Did everybody do that? We're good? Is this stuff really hard? just kind of dry. It's chemistry.
Okay, so for number 13, for sea salt, what are fluxes that add salt to the ocean? We already talked about that a lot. What are some fluxes that remove it? You can actually see in, in yellow, this diagram shows fluxes that remove salt from the ocean. Is it too hard to, too hard to read, Bree? You need, do you need glasses? Is that why? You can sit up here. There's lots of spots. I don't know what happened to there were some people that used to be here that are gone now. So there are biologic processes, like you know, marine life is using the salt in various ways. That can remove it. There's sea spray, that removes it. There's adsorption of salt onto various uh, sediment particles. That, that's a way of removing it. There's, um, there's also subduction. That removes it as well. Subduction isn't shown on here, but it does remove sea salt from the ocean as well. Okay. So there are processes that remove salt from the ocean. And that's why, this, that's why the oceans don't get saltier over you know, long periods of time. We're talking like millions of years. Are we ready to move on? Okay, so can anybody tell me what's a residence time? Because you're gonna to need to know what this, because we're gonna we're gonna build on this now. Okay? We're gonna build on this concept of residence time now. So what is can anybody tell me what is residence time? Yeah. It's like the average time that a chemical stays in the reservoir. Okay? So we're going to build on this now because we're going to talk about what are called conservative and non-conservative constituents. Conservative and non-conservative constituents. All right, so um, another thing we can talk about is something called mixing time. So the mixing time is how long does it take for a reservoir to completely mix? Now remember we talked about how, remember we talked about Force Shammer's principle, right? All of the chemical salts of the ocean are the same everywhere, right? And we concluded from that, remember I asked you, does that seem to indicate that the ocean is well mixed or not well mixed? And I think we all agree, people mentioned it means it's well mixed, right? So the ocean actually takes about 1,600 years to mix. That means for things to completely mix up. And that means that's actually what that is, is it's the residence time of H2O in the ocean. Okay, it's how long the average H2O molecule spends in the ocean. So if you meet an H2O molecule in the ocean, either today or later, and you ask it, how long have you been in this ocean for? It will say, on average, 1,600 years, 1,600 years. Okay. So that's the mixing time. That's how long it takes the ocean to actually mix and churn. Okay. So it takes about 1,600 years to mix ocean water. I looked up um, mixing ocean water, and I came up with this picture. <laughs> There's a drink called ocean water. So. So if you look up mixing ocean water, that's what you get on Google Images. Um, <clears throat> OK, so it takes about 1,600 years for the oceans to completely mix. So what this means is that if you have, we can compare that to the residence times of some chemical constituents. So here are the residence times of some other chemical constituents, okay? Are you all ready? Take a look at this. So what spends the most time, what has the longest residence time in the ocean? What's that? Chloride, right? So the average chloride molecule will spend a whopping 80 million years in the ocean. That's a lot. Okay, that's a lot more than the mixing time of the ocean. Okay? How about sodium? 60 million years. Mag magnesium? 10 million years. Sulfate? 9 million years. See what I'm, see what I'm getting at here? Okay, sulfate, 9 million, potassium, 6 million, calcium, 1 million, manganese, 7,000, okay? Now, this is the thing. Uh, 
ions with the longest residence times are most abundant in the ocean. But, but if the residence time of a particular chemical constituent is very long compared to the mixing time, it means that those are going to be completely well mixed into the ocean and they're going to be, they're going to apply, the four Schammer's principle is going to apply and those are going to be totally equal wherever you go in the ocean, okay? And you'll notice that most of the chemical constituents in the ocean have residence times that are much longer than the mixing time of the ocean. Is that all clear to everybody? Okay, so that's why four Schammer's principle works, okay? Wherever you go in the ocean, you'll notice that the composition of the sea salt is almost exactly the same. It's because the residence time of most of that salt, most of those chemical constituents of the salt, are greater than the mixing time of the ocean. Still with me? Okay. Now notice there are a few constituents in which that is not true. Does anybody see anything on this list that has a residence time shorter than the mixing time of the ocean? What's the mixing time of the ocean? 1,600 years. Are there any chemical constituents up here that have a residence time less than the mixing time? Aluminum and iron. Aluminum, the average aluminum atom only spends 100 years in the ocean. The average iron molecule only spends 100 years in the ocean. Okay, Those are going to be called, we make a distinction between these. We call these things up here conservative constituents, and these things non-conservative constituents. It's when the residence time of that particular chemical constituent is less than the mixing time of the ocean. And what that means is that four Schammer's principle will not apply here. So you will actually see differences in the abundance of aluminum and iron concentration in the ocean, depending on your location, your depth, or where you're actually looking. Okay? Whereas the rest of these things are going to be basically well mixed. So on the test, for example, if I gave you a table like this, and I could say, the mixing time of the ocean is 1,600 years. You know, which of these constituents should be well mixed in the ocean? Right? It, it, like, that means that wherever you go in the ocean, the concentration of this particular constituent should be the same. Well, you would answer, you know, manganese, calcium, potassium, sulfate, magnesium, because why? Because all of them have residence times greater than the mixing time of the ocean. So they have time to get well mixed by the ocean. These things, aluminum and iron, are non-conservative constituents because they have residence times less than the mixing time of the ocean. Okay? Clear as mud? Good. Does that seem feasible to do on a test? Could you ever do that? If I asked you, which of these are conservative and non-conservative constituents? You're just looking to see, is the residence time greater or less than that of the mixing time of the ocean? Okay, and that's going to spell out whether it's well mixed or it's not. And that, that particular chemical constituent is well mixed or not. And also, another way that you could say it is that aluminum and iron are not in steady state. So they're going to be changing. It's going to depend on the location, where you are. All the conditions are going to change, depending on location. It's just not well mixed in the ocean. Okay? It's a long class. Sorry. But I had a lot to get through today. Okay? So number 14. What is a conservative versus non-conservative constituent? Conservative constituent is just one that has a residence time, the chemical constituent with a residence time greater than the mixing time of the ocean. That's all you need to say. And hopefully that makes sense to you. Should I say that again? Do you got it? Should I say it again? No? You all got it then?
What is an example of a non-conservative constituent? Aluminum and iron. Those are non-conservative constituents in the ocean. That means they're not very well mixed in the ocean water. This kind of explains conservative and non-conservative constituents a little bit, a little bit more. Okay, so if this is confusing to you, is this confusing to anyone? No, everybody understands it. Okay, well then you can. That also kind of explains it. So non-conservative constituents have very short residence times, right? Shorter than that of the ocean mixing time. So non-conservative constituents are often relatively rare. They're removed quickly from the water. These are kind of what I call hot items in the water. They're just, they get used very quickly, often by marine life. So for iron, the reason that iron gets used so quickly is because, again, it's a hot item. A lot of marine life wants iron. It needs iron for, it's just like you. It's no different than you. You know, you need iron for your body. You know, iron deficiency, you probably heard it. It's a problem in the third world, developing world, or whatever you want to call it, right? So it's, it's a necessary chemical constituent for your body, just like it is for a lot of marine life. So they use it up quickly because there's not very much in the ocean. So it has a low residence time. It just gets used up very fast. Um, aluminum is actually, that's not the case for aluminum. The reason that aluminum gets used up very quickly is because of something called adsorption. So aluminum adsorbs, that means it adheres to the um, surface of sediment very easily, especially clays. So a lot of clay, there's, is there a lot of clay in the ocean, in the ocean sediment? Yeah, big time, right? So the clay sucks up that aluminum, it adsorbs onto the aluminum, or the aluminum adsorbs onto the clay particles and it removes it from the ocean. Okay, so that's, that's why it has such a, that's, that's why those two particular components have, are non-conservative. All right, I think I'm just gonna have to stop because I don't wanna open up this whole new can of worms with dissolved gases and we're already like 12, 15. So I'm gonna go, after we're done right now, I'm gonna go to the test and I'm gonna go snip, snip, snip and snip out everything that has to do with dissolved gases, okay? And so we'll talk about that. I'm gonna have to talk about it, I guess, after the test because it's a very important thing, but I just didn't get to it. I don't wanna talk about it right now, so. Anyway, um, so I will be here at Monday, 10 a.m., okay, to go through that study guide really fast, and it's kind of like I'm kind of teaching you bad things. It's, it's like a cram session right before, but it will help, right? So um, whatever it is I can do to help you with your grades. So anyway, um, if you want, be here at 10 a.m. on Monday, and we'll be going through that study guide, and I'll bring seven study guides, okay? That's how many people raise their hands. So besides that, have a good weekend, and I'll see you next time. Especially at 15 14. Yeah, and leave, leave uh, what, up to lecture assignment number 14. Remember the meeting here? Yeah. Yes. I didn't know that we were turning in 12 and 13 yesterday, but I Oh, them. okay. Okay. Is that okay? That's all right. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Just um, leave them at your table and I'll, I'll get them.